started. And so we should see folks starting to join. Yes, um, I see you all starting to join here. You can see that if you click on the participants, you'll see start uh, some of our colleagues starting to join. Let me go ahead and share my screen real quick. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. I see that our colleagues are starting to join. Um, if you've already joined, please open up the chat function uh, that you'll see at the bottom of your screen and let us know where you're based, maybe what you teach. Um, we'll be starting uh, by introducing our panelists to get to know them and where they teach, and we'd love to know a little bit about you too. So feel free to open up your chat to start uh, sharing that info with us, as um, I'm guessing we'll have some more folks joining. Um, so I'll keep an eye on, on the chat for that. But to start, my name is Fareed Mostofi. I'm the Associate Director of Education here at the Pulitzer Center. So excited to be with you all. Um, and uh, I'm based in DC today. I'll pass it over to my colleague from the Pulitzer Center, Haley. Hi, everyone. My name is Haley. I use she, her pronouns, also from the Pulitzer Center, and I am based in the Boston area. Thanks so much. And uh, the two of us aren't on the slide here because we're the stars of our show today um, are our incredible moderator and panelists, uh, starting with our moderator today, Stephen Johnson. I'll turn it over to Stephen to introduce himself. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephen Johnson. Uh, he, his, him. Um, uh, I'm in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, I'm the author of uh, 13 books now um, and uh, the co-creator and co-host of Extra Life, uh, the TV series, and the author of the Times Magazine article uh, that we're also discussing here today. Thank you so much for joining us and inspiring this work. Um, and uh, we are joined by five educators from four states and the District of Columbia who, um, who were uh, engaging with this work and bringing their own creativity and students' creativity to some projects we'll hear about today. We'd love to hear from each of them. I'll start with uh, Aqueta, over to you. Hi, I'm Aqueta McAllister and I'm from Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I teach social studies at the Career Center and I'm excited to be here with you guys today. Thank you. Uh, we're also joined by Anne Michelle Boyle. I'll turn it over to Anne Michelle. Hi, thanks. Uh, my name is Anne Michelle. I teach at Whitney Young High School in Chicago. I teach global citizenship to um, mostly juniors and seniors, and I use she, her, her pronouns. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, we are also joined by Shalia. Uh, I'll turn it over to you, Shalia. Hi, I'm Shalia Pabluski. I teach eighth and ninth grade English at Cooperstown Junior Senior High School in Cooperstown. New York, home of the Baseball Hall of Fame. Ooh, we all have to go visit. So excited to have you here, a member of our Fall Teacher Fellowship. Another member of our Fall Teacher Fellowship is here, Dr. Warren, over to you. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Cleopatra Warren. She, her pronouns. I'm based in Atlanta, Georgia. I teach high school social studies at the Coretta Scott King Young Women's Leadership Academy. Amazing, um, and also joined by a partner uh, and colleague here in the District of Columbia. Over to you, Tanita. Hi, Tanita Dozier, she, her pronouns. Um, I'm the media specialist at Hardy Middle School, grades six through eight, and I teach journalism. Great to be here. So great to have you here. And it looks like we're joined by some of your colleagues, uh, panelists from Winston-Salem. We also have um, guests joining us from Singapore, from Virginia, from Texas, um, ESL teachers, English teachers, environmental educators, educators from Toronto. Um, so this is gonna be a really exciting experience that includes all of us, because not only will we be hearing from our panelists and from our guest journalist, Stephen Johnson, but we've uh, scheduled lots of time for Q and A where all of our collective questions and discoveries are gonna help us better engage with this project, which is an explore, exploring a, a very important underreported issue, underreported story, the story of the uh, doubling of human life, life expectancy over the last century. Um, so who's hosting this session? Let me turn it over to my colleague Haley to tell you a little bit about the Pulitzer Center. 
Thank you, Fareed. Um, so to start, uh, the Proletar Center is a journalism organization, and you can read our mission here. Um, we support journalists with grants and funding to report on underreported issues um, around the globe. And it's common to associate journalism and the news with maybe headlines or breaking news, those trending topics that you see in social media or what you see on the front page. But journalism is also about storytelling. And I think there are a lot of stories um, that are equally important, but they aren't getting enough attention that they um, deserve in the mainstream media. So on the next slide, um, I'll just um, put, put a name to that. And that is what we at the Pulitzer Center call the underreported story. And they are at the heart of the Pulitzer Center. We have a really great video that we will link to um, later so you can learn more about that. But I think um, we'll be talking about an underreported story um, throughout our, our conversation today. Um, so you'll get a sense of what that is in the, in the realm of public health. Um, and on the next slide, um, I just wanted to share a couple of other examples um, that Pulitzer Center grantees have investigated in terms of topics, and these issues can range from racial justice, climate change, migration, public health, and more. So we encourage you to look at those um, when you have the time. And on the following slide, um, I'll just also share that these are some of the um, outlets and places where our grantees have had their work published. So you may be familiar with some of them. If there's one that you follow, feel free to share in the chat. We would love to know. Um, and then just on the next slide, um, connecting this to what we're talking about today in terms of education and having you all here, um, once a Pulitzer Center grantee or a guest contributor uh, partner has their work published, we have this incredible the K-12 and university levels. Um, and if you wouldn't mind just going to the next slide, um, I can chat briefly about some of these education programs and resources. Um, and it, you know, on our website, we not only have the published work of grantees, which includes the thousands of articles, photos, and videos on, on these underreported issues, but we also have programs and events that directly engage students with the reporting topics. So these could be lesson plans and curriculum, which is what we'll be talking about today. Um, we also uh, do uh, virtual journalist visits um, where we bring in journalists through Skype or other or Zoom to um, your classrooms. And um, we also have student contests such as a poetry writing contest that we're just wrapping up this spring um, and also workshops both for students and teachers. So that was a super quick overview because we do want to focus the majority of our time on the conversation today with our amazing guests. Um, but we can definitely include more information about the Pulitzer Center in the chat and any follow-up information. So with that, I will turn it back over to Fareed to introduce the curriculum and what we have coming next. So uh, this all started with a partnership with our guest moderator today, Stephen Johnson, to support this amazing reporting we'll hear more about today. And then with creating curricular resources that really look at just some entry points to this reporting, comprehension questions, discussion questions, activities. Um, this is a, a glimpse at what those resources look like. They're available for free to you now. Um, but today we're going to see how when teachers saw, uh, this team of teachers saw this material and thought about their students, um, how these curricular resources grew to even cooler, um, um, wider reaching experiences that all of us could learn from. And hopefully some of us leave today thinking of ideas we could take to our students. So to give us a background about the story, I'll turn it over to our guest moderator, Stephen Johnson, to tell us a little bit about Extra Life. Thank you, Fareed, appreciate it. And I just wanna thank the Pulitzer Center and uh, all our educators on the panel today for being involved with this, for teaching this in the classrooms. It's such a, an honor for me to hear how it's going, what's working, what's not working. Um, but the education component of this project has been so important to me. Uh, from the beginning. Uh, so I thought I'd just take a few minutes to explain kind of where this came from and what the vision has been. Um, I, I've written over the course of my career um, a number of books about 
a, a range of topics. I mean, I wrote a book about brain science and I wrote a book about cholera in London and I wrote a book about 18th century chemistry and video games, a whole bunch of different things. But they have all had this interest in new ideas and innovation driving change in society and trying to understand how, how change really happens and what are the forces that come together that make you know, truly transformative change in the way that we live, uh, in the way that we communicate, um, or in the case of this, the kind of health we have. And about four years ago, I, I started thinking about the idea of writing, in a sense, a, a kind of in a history book, but a history book where the central protagonist would not be a, a you know, heroic military figure or a leader of a civil rights movement, but rather a number. Um, and, and in this case, the number of global life expectancy as a fundamental measure of the, the literal and figurative health of a society. How long do, does the average person in a country, in a community on, 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 the, on earth get to live? Um, and I knew from some other books I'd written in, in the past, including a book called The Ghost Map many years ago about cholera in London that there had been a tremendous change in average life expectancy over the last, particularly over the last 100 years, but, but dating back about 200 years. And so I thought it would be an interesting project to kind of dive into that and try and explain how we moved the needle on that, on that fundamental number. And I basically began to realize that we had doubled it over the last century since the, the, the end of the Spanish flu, the great influenza, um, the, the last great pandemic, which ended around 1919 and 1920. And that seemed to be a really interesting kind of milestone to say that we had doubled the average human lifespan, that that was a, a, an extraordinary thing. And to use the language that Fried and Haley were using, in a sense, it was an underreported story. And I think it's an underreported story, even though it is such a momentous change in how we live and how long we get to live, because it is made up of things that don't fit into the normal news cycle. It's basically made up of small incremental changes implemented all over the world by thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people, um, advancing human health you know, in their, in their local limited ways that add up to a, a massive change. But there's, it's very rare that you see, you know, threshold moments, breakthrough moments that make the headlines. And so it gets underreported. If it, there's an, a kind of analogy that I use in the, in the book and in the, in the Times Magazine article, which is if a newspaper came out once every hundred years, what would the headline be? And I think the headline would be, we doubled the average human lifespan. That's an, that is an amazing thing. But day to day, it doesn't make the headlines. And so I was trying to kind of complement and supplement that, that kind of missing piece in the, in the story. And I wrote most of it um, two or three years ago um, and you know, entirely in pre-COVID times. And then we started putting together um, kind of the resources and support to make the PBS series, um, which is also included in this, uh, the wonderful curriculum materials that Pulitzer has put together. And right as we were starting to make the show portion of it um, was basically, you know, March of 2020. And suddenly all this material that I've been working on about the history of public health and the history of vaccines and the history of changing behavior to make people healthier suddenly was the most important news story in the world. Um, and so the show in particular, uh, for those of you who get to see it or some of the clips that are uh, on the Pulitzer Center's website, it actually weaves um, the history of human health alongside the more recent stories of the fight against COVID-19 and the development of the vaccines and so on. So hopefully what we've tried to do with this whole project is to create a new kind of pantheon of heroes that we can really celebrate and inspire kids to, to go out and solve the, the remaining problems in health. And we have plenty of them as we've seen from this pandemic out there. But hopefully by telling these stories, we can inspire them and say, look, we've made progress. But, you know, the last hundred years has really been a story of extraordinary advance in, in how people live and how healthy their lives are. Um, let's keep going. Thank you so much. And I'm sure we'll get um, another glimpse at uh or more and more glimpses at the reporting as we see how students engaged. And thank you, Stephen, for joining us to moderate and for this amazing reporting.
Uh, so to start off our presentations about some ideas we could learn from and also to celebrate some amazing student work, I'll turn it over to Aqueta McAllister. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I teach at a public high school in Winston-Salem, where students come primarily to take AP courses, but also to take career and technical education classes. And when I learned about this project, we were at almost the end of our school year. And it's been one of those years, as all of you know. Um, and I was so excited because I, I said to Fareed, well, we are in this, we're at this point where students are really like finished, but they were still getting ready to take their exams. And the AP Human Geography course is what I was going to be uh, using this particular information for. And so, um, I was really excited because we do a unit and you can flip the, um, you can go to the next slide for Um, I was excited because, um, we were, we were reviewing and one of our major units is demography. And in our demography unit, we connect a lot to sort of like crude birth rate, crude death rate, the natural increase rate, life expectancy, infant mortality rates. And so this was perfect because it wasn't just a review of material, it's, it put it in a context of history and science over time and how the development of countries around the world um, actually were experiencing these demographic changes. And so it was perfect as a review for me. And so the reason I connected to this was because even though we were finished with our sort of learning for the year, we needed to review uh, particularly a lot of these concepts and variables uh, to prepare for our exam. And you can go to the next slide for you. So what did I have my students do? Well, in our review, we watched each of, so the Pulitzer Center took clips from each of the Extra Life series and um, made them into like bite-sized pieces for students. So they were like 10, no more than 10 minute segments. Um, and they watched those segments for a series of days. So we watched them over like seven days, I believe. And then we would talk about the guided questions that had been um, supplied by the Pulitzer Center. My students started though by reading the Living Century or re reading part of the Living Century, which um, have, that we had access to. Um, and we discussed that and talked about sort of connections that we saw between um, the history that was given to us and the science that was talked about in the living century and how we could connect it to what we had learned in class. So for my students' final project, um, I this was a suggestion actually that came from the Pulitzer Center, was for students to craft a public service announcement of a underreported like medical advancement that they um, they saw expand life or enhance life um, in the world. And so um, what I wanna share with you is a couple of uh, samples of the work that my students uh, created. I had one student who did, who talked about birth control and he made a connection to poverty and birth control. Another student did um, mental health of healthcare workers. And he was in particular thinking about um, the mental health of nurses under this pandemic. Um, the two pieces that I want to show you in just a little segment um, were chest x-rays in terms of addressing tubercul tubercul tuberculosis, and the other one was about toxic shock syndrome. So you can go to the next slide, please. So if you'll just play maybe about 20 seconds of this one, this student I thought did a great job in her presentation. I don't know if it's coming up. X-ray vans began to be used in the 1930s to detect tuberculosis. In 1940, prior to the introduction of antibiotic therapy, 
Tuberculosis remained a leading cause of death. Extra surveying vans went from community to community, scanning the residents. Even those without, without symptoms were x-rayed. These screening campaigns made it possible to detect TB earlier, thus it was not allowing it to progress to a life-threatening condition. All right, also that, that's stop good the spread. for that one. Um, and then the next one that I presented uh, was toxic shock syndrome. And I thought this was interesting because the student talks about how this is important in terms of women's health. So um, we'll just play a couple of seconds of this as well. As a woman, I feel as if it's my job to partake in the education of young women about their bodies. Many women who just started menstruation are unaware of the dangers that can lie ahead. There is an estimated 1 in 100,000 menstruating women who get toxic shock syndrome every year. TSS is rare and life-threatening, but the good news is that it is preventable. Symptoms to look out for are high fever, low blood pressure, vomiting, headaches, nausea, and more. Okay, that's great. If you see you. any of these signs, don't... So, um, I just really thought that the students did a really beautiful job with these uh, public service announcements, and I really appreciate the Pulitzer Center uh, being the catalyst for us being able to review as well as um, actually the students creating their own sort of projects in this way. And I really look forward to using um, all of the resources that have been gathered for us next year when I teach my human geography course. So thank you. Thank you so much. And if we could all send some snaps some celebrations uh, to Aqueta and the students who embarked on these projects, cannot wait to explore these more. Uh, when we follow up, we'll be sharing uh, some of this information with you there as well. Our next speaker is Anne Michelle Boyle. I'll turn it over to you, Anne Michelle. Thanks, Fareed. And you can uh, switch the slide, Fareed. Thank you. All right, so I read the New York Times every Sunday. And on Sunday, May 2nd, I was reading the New York Times. And as soon as I saw this cover story, I was intrigued. Um, and as soon as I started reading the piece, I knew that I had to juggle some things and move my curriculum around so that I could end the year with the living century. Uh, my class, Global Citizenship, explores the big issues of today, hunger, poverty, inequality, climate change, global health, equity, sustainability. And while covering these big issues, I'm constantly trying to infuse a sense of hope in a lot of topics that often feel hopeless. And this New York Times piece was just a great reminder and even more so a wake-up call that us humans have accomplished something pretty extraordinary in the past century through a global approach by scientists, politicians, journalists, activists, the doubling of human life expectancy in a single century. It's extraordinary. Um, and especially considering us humans, homo sapiens, um, you know, are 200, 250,000 years old. And, you know, just in the past century, we've gone from a life expectancy of, you know, in the 30s to in the 70s. So wrapping up the school year with the living century was a great way to take a step back from all the issues we've explored all year and to acknowledge something that has, for better or worse, benefited all of us in the here and now. Uh, and Fareed, you could um, turn the slide. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so after reading the piece, um, we had a, a book club discussion and you know it was a free-flowing conversation. It was an hour long and uh, students shared just how they connected with it. And, you know, I included the quote that I think a lot of students were just, you know, flabbergasted, enthralled, and wanted to really uh, dig into. Um, Fari, do you want to turn the slide? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so after having a book club discussion with all uh, five sections of my class, then we did uh, mini projects. And Fari, do you want to switch the slide again? And so I gave students a bunch of different options. Um, in terms of what they could pick for this project. Um, and students were able to choose what route they wanted to take and, you know, and how they did it. And so um, some students chose to read, um, you know, the accompanying environmental racism piece that was in here by Linda Villarosa. Others chose the debate oriented piece by uh, Ferris Jobber and reflected with an essay. Uh, and Farid, you can turn the slide again. Thank you. 
Um, and, and students that chose that wrote uh, really impressive essays. Freed, you can turn the slide again. Others uh, created artwork inspired by, a, you know, inspired by the piece, like my student Sherry. Freed, you can turn the slide. Uh, some students wrote letters to the editor of the New York Times Magazine, Jake Silverstein, uh, articulating what, um, you know, what images and photos they thought worked best in here and which uh, images, illustrations, photos they disagreed with. Freedy can turn the slide. Uh, some students chose to create uh, cartoons inspired by the living century and specifically uh, the milk pasteurization story, which students, um, you know, I don't know, that, that was a favorite of uh, conversation um, that came out of all the book clubs. Faridi can turn the slide. Some students ran with, uh, with the um, beginning part of this piece that, that um, where um, Mr. Johnson talked about uh, the once a century newspaper and so created their own once in a century newspaper getting at other big things they thought would have um, been featured in the newspaper. Faridi can turn the slide. And some students created TikToks and Farid, you can just press play on this one and then the next one as well. I'm out here on the come up. I'll be the drummer. I roll up no more drama. Yeah, thank you. And then here's one more TikTok. Thanks. Uh, so all in all, it was a um, it was a great way to finish the school year. Students really enjoyed uh, digging into um, conversations that went all over the place in terms of the piece and then also doing a project. And thanks for letting me share what my students did with the Living Century. Thank you, and Michelle, I think a lot of us were, were trying to read those comics and letters. So thank you so much for sharing and hopefully we'll be able to share some of this work with, with you all so you can look further. Congratulations and congratulations to your students. And I will turn it over to Shalia. Hi everybody, next slide please. So I'm uh, teaching at Cooperstown. I've really wanted to bring culturally responsive teaching to my classroom this year. I knew that with the pandemic, students were going to need a different kind of curriculum than uh, just necessarily the same old thing that had always been done. Um, and they needed something that was responding to what they were experiencing. I also wanted to make some local connections. Um, Bassett Medical Center is a hospital where many of my students' parents are employed in some capacity, many of them plan to go on to work there uh, themselves. So uh, they do uh, open heart surgery field trip and they're very um, open to collaborating with the school. They have a new visions program through BOCES where students go to um, work on pre-med projects as high school students. So um, that was another thing that was in the back of my mind when I saw the extra life project that there could be a tie in there. Having done the Pulitzer Center Teacher Fellowship in the fall, I've really just tried to take advantage of everything the Pulitzer Center has to offer. Um, we had a wonderful journalist visit from Melba Newsom. Um, we participated in their Environment Redefined uh, Environmental Conference, which was incredible for students. Um, they've done the Fighting Words Poetry Contest. They wrote letters. Um, so I, when I saw this, come up as an opportunity, I thought, well, this would be a great way to get my eighth graders involved because most of the other things I had done either with ninth grade or with the literary magazine that I advise. Next slide, please. So I, I only had a few days to set aside for this because we were finishing the year with another unit on the book March um, by John Lewis, which is a graphic novel. So uh, the visual from the video really tied in with it. and. Um, 
I, I kind of presented it to the students as I'm, I'm doing this project and you're going to help me with it and let me know um, how I can use it in the future and, and whether you like it and what you think about it. So we started with the one minute trailer from Extra Life and I wound up using the vocab warm up from the Living Century article because it um, sort of condensed all of the different vocabs from the different clips because I was just kind of doing them all at once. So then day two, we did some of the, some more of the clips and we had a social emotional learning lesson. Our counselor comes in once a month with the eighth graders to do um, Scholastic Choices Magazine. So she did a gratitude mini lesson with them, which they made these amazing connections to extra life because they thought about the gratitude of the fact that here we all are because people were either extraordinary lucky or hand washing or penicillin or, or these different things. So um, then on the third day, we finished up with the clips and I made a Google form. It was so easy and quick using the discussion questions that were provided by the Pulitzer Center. And I added a few extra just to go along with that idea of, of how can these uh, be used in the classroom and, and what do you guys think of this as young people uh, learning for the first time some of these uh, incredible ideas that came out of the project. Next slide, please. So this is a screenshot of the feedback form. You can see the questions are the same that are available on the Pulitzer Center website. Um, and the standards I was trying to hit with this were 21st century skills of getting students to really be fully aware of their surroundings, able to communicate clearly with an understanding of the implications of what they're saying and, and what they are doing. Um, I wanted to connect with STEAM. I'm always interested in doing interdisciplinary collaborations, uh, and I think it helps bring students in who might not otherwise be as interested in the course, um, maybe thinking that English doesn't apply to what they want to do, and learning that, in fact, it does. And they definitely have that buy-in when they have some choice in the matter and uh, some say in what they're learning about. Next slide, please. So the remaining questions for the uh, overall project are here. I didn't do the individual ones from the lesson guides and in the future, I would like to do that when, with a more expanded unit. But I did add a few questions of my own, um, which I won't read through all of them now because on the next couple slides as I'm sharing the results, I will share the question again as I uh, give some examples for my students. Next slide, please. So the first question was, what most surprised you about the causes and effects of increased life expectancy? And many of the students were the most surprised just the fact that it had increased that much, that they didn't even realize that fact. Um, but um, this quote that I chose, other risks as effects of an increased life expectancy, they hadn't kind of thought that far ahead of, oh, this, this could have kind of a domino effect or uh, create different things going on. And I had a few students who were most surprised by the effects of racism on life expectancy, and they were surprised and said that it made them fearful uh, that uh, the idea of weathering that was presented in one of the clips. The second question was what challenges for individuals, families, countries, and the environment to come with an increased life expectancy? Um, and they thought about deforestation, they thought about quite a few um, different possibilities, elder care. Uh, I, I thought one was interesting. You had to buy more soap and cleaning products. So it was another thing on your list to buy, which at first I thought was kind of a funny answer to that question, um, but it had some deeper implications about poverty. Um, and I, I thought that for an eighth grade level, they were really engaging pretty deeply with that question. The third question was about given the current stage of global health and innovation, what do you think the next major medical innovation will be and why? Um, and most of the students focused their answers on vaccines, which I thought was great. Um, the second leading answer was cancer uh, treatment and cure. So the fourth question, why do you think health reporting tends to focus more on challenges rather than solutions? And I really loved their answers to these because I think from an adult perspective, um, we often hear, oh, why is there so much negativity? Why can't we focus more on the positive? And they really did not look at this question that way. They did not see it as a negative thing. Um, they were just very practical. So without a challenge, there can be no solution. So they were kind of more like, just bring it on, tell, tell us what's wrong so we can fix it. And they really seemed to have a lot of feeling of personal responsibility that it was gonna be their generation that 
was going to have to solve these problems. So it, it was sort of like they were expecting to hear problems because they were going to have to fix them. The fifth question, uh, many of the stories chronicled in this series are underrepresented in our collective knowledge of global medical history. Some may argue that the general public doesn't know much about these tremendous life-saving breakthroughs. How do you think an increased public awareness of the health discoveries explored in the series might impact society? Um, and really the answers were geared toward the idea that knowledge saves lives and that if more people know about it, as this quote said, that there would be more people trying to do something to uh, make positive change. Next slide, please. So the rest of the questions were the ones that I added. I asked, do you like learning about science topics in English class? And would you be interested in doing an expanded unit on this topic in English next year? And the overwhelmingly positive majority said yes that they did want to do that. I had 20 yeses, one maybe, one no, because we've already done this, let's do something else. Um, and one suggested a history of language. So Stephen, if you'll have a book written, article published and PBS documentary filmed by next fall, we'll be all over it. Uh, but I really liked that comment. We don't do this type of learning in any other class. So it made me think, okay, we, we do need to do it in English class and it is relevant and important. Uh, question seven, uh, how can you connect things you learn from extra life to themes about equality in the book March, which we were reading? Um, and uh, they said that it was more than just a legal inequality about segregation, that it had health effects as well. So I thought that was an amazing connection. Um, and in Extra Life, we see solutions coming from people with different backgrounds, which is uh, wonderful for students to see so that they, they know that they're represented and that problems can be solved globally. Question eight, what was your favorite unit this year and why? And students mostly said it was extra life. Between that, I did the giver, a poetry unit, uh, short stories with a telltale heart debate. Um, and we did a Night of the Notables project where students dress up as historical figures and research them. But they really enjoyed March and extra life. They said the visual aspect of it was good for them. Um, that it was nice to learn about and watch stuff like that all the, because they watch stuff like that all the time. Uh, the nonfiction, they enjoyed doing current events and that it was relatable to them. For question nine, I had, was there anything that you didn't enjoy about the class or have any suggestions to make it better or more inclusive, which I borrowed that uh, from the Pulitzer Center a little bit because whenever they do a, a survey, they always ask how they can be more inclusive, which I think is amazing because they're quite inclusive. Um, so I, I wanted to do that too. And a lot of them had no suggestions for that, even though I know that my class can be even more inclusive than, than it is as I try to be. Um, but I did have one student, only one in the group said that um, they were uncomfortable with some of the images, that, uh, that it was a little bit graphic for them, which maybe for eighth grade, uh, just give a warning or, or let students know what to expect. I think if I had had more time to do a little bit more uh, warm up or um, prepare them for that would be helpful. And the final question I asked was just how they thought they did in eighth grade, a little self-reflection on uh, whether they thought the pandemic prevented them from learning things that they needed for high school or whether they felt prepared. And um, almost all of them had uh, um, said that there was some effect, um, but most of them also had a positive outlook that they had worked through it or found a way to find success. Next slide, please. So just going forward for next year, I'd like to use some excerpts from the article because we loop at Cooperstown. So my students that I had in eighth grade, I will have again in ninth grade. Our honors program begins in ninth grade as well. So I definitely like to bring the article in for them and uh, possibly the book as an independent reading assignment. I'd love to do a virtual author visit again after we did the one with Melvin Newsom was so great. Uh, and even possibly making that connection with Bassett or one of the other uh, public health speakers from Pulitzer Center. So just ideas. Um, they and my students enjoy doing research and some ask for more research and writing projects. Uh, and I do a debate unit. This was my project for the fellowship in the fall to uh, do debates in the ninth grade on um, current events, which they were very mature about and able to handle um, met my expectations and beyond, which, which I was really proud of. So I could definitely see this becoming a part of that project as well. 
And I just had that, uh, a, a student jotted that uh, picture down, <laughs> that little sketch of David from the PBS documentary. So thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Shalia. I'll turn it over to Dr. Warren. Hello, everyone. Next slide, Fareed. Thank you. Next slide. So I'll begin with our school community profile. Again, I teach high school social studies, grades nine through 12 at the Coretta Scott King Young Women's Leadership Academy in Atlanta, Georgia. My primary focus is, of course, AP US history and economics. We are a predominantly African-American single gender public school named in honor of the life and legacy of Mrs. Coretta Scott King. We have a STEM designation and also 100% graduation rate. So I really want to center uh, our community uh, because it's a critical point throughout this conversation. We are a Title I school, 99% free and reduced lunch. And we're located in a major urban center, 22% of uh, students between the ages of five and 18 live in poverty in Atlanta. That's one out of four students. And so what we're seeing in our community, of course, are shifting socioeconomic dynamics, widespread gentrification. And our school is located in a food desert. So food apartheid is a social issue uh, regarding racialized access to healthy and affordable food. According to the American Heart Association, 500,000 children in Atlanta, Georgia live in a food desert. Next slide. So my why regarding this project centered around my primary focus this year um, related to our overarching theme of underreported stories. And I wanted to situate this work in the lived experiences of my students. And their ways of knowing, being, and doing are always at the center of my instructional practice. And I wanted to, with this culminating activity, to focus specifically on the work of Dr. Fernando Ramers, Five Eyes to Educate Global Citizens. I chose for the purpose of this project to focus on the cultural perspective. I wanted students to assess and analyze the big picture of how their school relates to the larger society in terms of the broader set of societal hopes for school norms and values which define what are accepted educational goals and practices and in terms of how those social expectations change. Now given uh, our timeline there were time constraints. Our school year ended two weeks ago and this of course occurred after uh, the administration of the AP exam. However, students were still able to immerse themselves in this work. And we also focused on the political perspective. I wanted students to focus on the counter narrative and I wanted them to focus on a much larger global perspective. Next slide, please. And so I decided to design a culminating activity and I use the living longer, living better activity. And I wanted to introduce the resource by having students watch a video of four health experts discuss life expectancy and public health in the face of COVID-19. And so I identified four pillars of student engagement. I wanted students to have a primary focus on their cultural capital what they're bringing to the process. I wanted us to engage dialogically through critical questions and critical conversations about the community at large. And given our focus, of course, on historiography, primary and secondary sources, the third pillar, of course, focused on historical literacy and media literacy. And finally, the fourth pillar, critical aspects of self-definition. So I really, I wanted to have students center themselves, their communities within a much broader context of global community engagement. Next slide, please. And so the primary focus here was counter narration, an asset versus a deficit approach. How are we going to approach this work? 
And so I wanted students to, of course, approach this work from a social justice orientation and make connections across the neighborhood. Next slide, please. So we used for our culminating activity, the student viewing guide for living longer, living better. And my primary focus as we scaffolded this assignment was to focus on the interdisciplinary community problem solving, the how. And so students were asked to assess their community's assets. And so several assets included stable housing, economic function, food, clean air, drinkable water, and education. And so as a part of our discussion, and of course the culminating activity, I wanted students to consider their own communities. And the questions posed were, what assets does your community have? Are they accessible to everyone? What assets are your community lacking? And so just to give you a backstory, Atlanta is a highly segregated city. And there is a, an area of town referred to in North Atlanta as Buckhead. And my school is located in an area of town uh, better known as the Bankhead area. So there's the Buckhead-Bankhead uh, dichotomy. And the Bankhead area is predominantly African-American, high poverty, and there are a lot of issues um, related to communities that um, experience high poverty rates. And I, I wanted to focus again on the asset-based approach, the cultural capital approach, and to extract students' lived experiences in their communities by having them craft presentations or write short essays describing the assets their communities have and then the assets they still need to cultivate. And this activity was extracted from the student viewing guide, Living Longer, Living Better. Next slide, please. And so I had students create um, story maps through Google Slides, Flipgrid activities. Some decided to just journal and write essays and some created newsletters. So. For the purposes of this presentation, I want to just highlight briefly some of the work I received. And so the community assets, of course, access to drinking water, shopping centers, entertainment structures, playgrounds, housing, as well as grocery stores. Next slide, please. My student, Sanaya Hatcher, highlighted um, jobs, parks, clubs, and she says, this, this is a good asset, but it isn't enough. And then she went on to highlight uh, the need for grocery stores, pharmacies, and additional daycare support. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. And then we chose to focus on what assets are your community lacking? And so this student decided to focus on crime we are in a crisis here in our city. So she decided to focus on uh, the crime issue in Atlanta. Next slide. And another student, Danielle Leverett, decided to focus on the environment. And she is highlighting this as an environmental justice issue. And she states, instead of throwing trash where it belongs, our neighbors choose to litter in our environment, endangering it. And she also decides to, and, and makes a, a critical choice to align her statements, of course, with the impact COVID-19 has had on the community. Next slide, please. Uh, this student decided to create a newsletter. Assets, of course, in her community, close, close grocery stores, stable housing schools, and then assets her community lacks, dog parks, community organizations, and open greenery. Next slide, please. And then I had a student create a newscast. So I'm gonna share my screen. And she decided to create a newscast based on 
the roundtable discussion. Topic of COVID-19. Throughout the times in COVID and lockdown, the rate of unemployment rate is similar to that of the Great Depression. I specifically want to talk about Black unemployment rates as it will tie into my future commentary. Blacks throughout the Great Depression had two to three times higher chances of losing their jobs, money, and experiencing detrimental effects compared to white Americans. Blacks also experienced nearly 1.5 higher unemployment rate, around 11.4%, to that of the national average due to COVID-19 and the lockdown, which is around 8.1%. Stable housing, adequate food supply, economic stability, and education are all signs that contribute to better health. When it is gone, what are Blacks left with? Poverty. According to Living Longer, Living Better from Webinar and their partnership with CUGH, the group who had lower assets to begin with were less able to isolate, work from home, and reduce their risk of getting COVID-19, plus the underlying illnesses due to the lack of these assets, which ultimately continues to higher vulnerability in attracting COVID. The just position for poor... I'm going to stop there for read and move to the final slide. Thank you. So that was student Desiree Archibald's newscast. And so our critical lessons and key takeaways included action was connected to learning and knowledge, literacy embedded in the learning experience. I wanted to cultivate the hearts and minds of students to get them thinking critically about their community, COVID-19, and then all of these other pillars. The power of thinking was not minimized. Students were given a choice to focus on specific areas. And then several decided to focus on all of those key critical areas. We saw joy as much as we saw rigor. Education was connected to disrupting and unhinging colonized thinking. Education was in the pursuit of equity for all and learning was connected to problem solving. Thank you so much. This concludes my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Warren. Um, and our panelists have agreed to stay uh, a, a little extra. So we will hold some space until about 10 after for questions. So feel free to start adding your questions um, and uh, all the ways you're connecting in the chat. Um, all of panelists, I hope you're getting to see in the chat, a lot of connections are being made to the work that you all are doing. Um, for our final presentation, I'll turn it over to Tanita. Hello, next slide, thank you. Good to be with you all. So um, for us at Hardy Middle School, just background, we are grades six through eight. So many of my students, they range in age from um, 11 years old to 14. Um, so we focused on the Extra Life video series. Next slide, please. All right, so this is for anyone who's considering using this material with middle school students. Um, we focused on in-class activities, which is very important, especially if you're teaching an electives course. I'm, I'm the media specialist, but I teach a journalism course. So with this grade level, it's very important to engage them with something that they can actually do, on, um, do together and we created collaborative boards. So this was a 100% virtual learning environment because we are still working from home. Number one, you need computer access, video clips, Nearpod collaborative or chat access, and MS Teams access. These are all the materials that you would need to complete this project with your students in class. Next slide. All right. So lessons and exit tickets. There, first we started each day with an introduction. Students watched an introductory video and they discussed um, in the chat or aloud. Um, also, we had warm-ups. We used the warm-ups that were provided by um, Pulitzer Center, but because I knew my students and um, I would also create warm-ups based on prior discussions and feedback during class. Um, video clips, they watched a video, one per class period. It's important to make sure with this age group that you don't give them too much video, that they're overwhelmed, just enough so that they can um, understand the material, participate, share the material, and, you know, they're not burned out. Collaborative boards. The Nearpod was used, and if you're not familiar with the Nearpod, um, Nearpod, you can look up Nearpod online, nearpod.com, but it is an electronic collaborative board, digital board. Our students at Hardy have been using those them throughout the school year. They love them. It's an awesome way 
um, to allow them to work with each other and to create visual digital boards and also um, analyze information at the same time and include visual graphics. Next slide, please. All right, so here's an example of what the Nearpod looks like. If you can see on the right-hand side, they these are the posts of students that take place live in class. Um, and I gave an example of one of the first questions here. So um, this is an example of student questions and responses. Number one, students log into the Nearpod collaborative board. They type a written response graphics and discuss responses with their peers. If you notice, this is in quotations. This is from Allie. Um, Allie B. Um, so you're going to see the, the question that she's responding to on the next slide, but here's her answer. I wanted you to just see what it looks like. When you make a vaccine, you're preventing thousands or millions of deaths from um, that particular disease, therefore increasing life expectancy, expectancy um, if they can prevent more death. All right, so let's go to the next slide. Um, so this is what the warm-up question looked like. This was taken directly from the lesson that was provided by Pulitzer Center. Um, extra life warm up using Nearpod. How can global health innovations impact human life expectancy? So this is the question that the students saw at the top of the board. On the next slide, you will see a visual of the overall screen. All right, and so this is what it looks like. If you look at the top, the teacher or the instructor will input right here at the top. Will input the question designated as a warm up, and as you can see, students immediately begin responding. They receive a code at the top of the class period. I also share a link inside their regular MS Teams chat, and as you can see, multiple posts from students, and this takes place during the class period. Next slide, please. All right, and these are just more, and you can see where students actually in inserted um, images as well. And so as they're typing the text, if you look at the bottom where it says share your thoughts and images here, it's, you know, it has a, a, a text post limit, but they go in and they actually utilize these graphs, graphics, but they have to research the graphics based on the information, which is also an opportunity to revisit their understanding of the information on the material. And, you know, they've been spot on. Um, all of their images. This is another way of differentiating the learning so that all students can participate for, from the 11 year old to the 14 year old as they are in the same class peers. And also students who um, have, uh, you know, different learning abilities. The Nearpod is an excellent way for them to all, for all students to participate. Um, and, you know, if, you, if you're certainly interested in differentiating your learning and they all feel comfortable and confident and they also get an opportunity to share their posts um, aloud. It's a great way to get the students who aren't necessarily um, vocal. You can call on them because they've shared here. Most of the time they're far more open to sharing their posts because they've already written them there. Next slide, please. All right, so here's another example. Um, students same instructions but i wanted you to look at the very bottom global health innovations can help human life this is an exact quote live longer and can decrease the number of people who get viruses it can also help pets too that was from afra and i wanted to i put this here and this is in quotations so and i left it just as the student wrote it to also um, emphasize the grade level but notice that this child mentioned pets. That's very important because right now, you know, pets are important to our children. Pets are important to our families. And being that we are actually living in um, a global pandemic and we've been studying this, all of these different um, epide uh, epidemics and global health crisis um, through history, it shows, you know, the spirit of a child that you're mentioning something that she's being optimistic um, about an animal. It's just that she is human life. Next. All right, so this was another lesson on hand washing. And I posted this one um, just because this was probably one of the most engaging activities that the students participated in. They were very interested in this because um, you know, so the, if you're not familiar with this series, this is the series where we're introducing to the introduced to the importance of hand washing um, and the introduction of Florence Nightingale. This was, you know, it's dual. Uh, Florence Nightingale, she's a woman, um, and the with prior videos, students had learned about William Farr and 
um, male scientists and contributors to global health. But this was a time when they were introduced to a woman um, who had a major impact. <laughs> and we're still talking about and referring to hand washing right now. They could all jump in. Everybody could identify, you know, said, what's the first thing that your mom or your dad tells you to do when you walk in the house, especially now um, over the past year? everybody screamed out, wash your hands. And so it was interesting to go back and for them to learn that there was a time when people didn't wash their hands and large numbers of, of people in the military died simply uh, for by not washing their hands. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so here's a closer up board visual. And you can see that students, um, you can see the different levels of graphics they um, included regular graphics, uh, photo graphics. And as you can see, there's a photo here of an image of Florence Nightingale. If you look at the top, this particular Mitchell, the student Mitchell, you notice he said part two of three. He was so into this that he created three different posts to extend all of the information that he gathered just from the video clip. All right, thank you. Next. All right, so this is what the question looked like. Um, uh, the question was, how has hand washing improved human life? How did Florence Nightingale contribute to this? And what was her occupation? So it's a three-part question, but it was an also, also an opportunity for them to make sure that they were paying attention all the way through and could answer those questions. Next, please. All right, and it, the thing is here, we'll focus on this student response. Lawrence Nightingale contributed to this by laying out data um, to Britain, and they figured out that they needed to start washing their hands. That was by a student. And I only emphasize data because the student carried this information from a prior lesson on data. So this was, you know, this represented um, their prior learning. Next. All right, and so if you notice, I won't read all of this one, but if you look at the bottom, this particular student, um, notice it just says student two. So if you are using a Nearpod and you want your students to remain, remain anonymous, you can do that too. Next. In conclusion, by the end of the lesson, students demonstrated their understanding of the text by collaborating with their peers. They posted an electronic text and visual post to further demonstrate their understanding. What worked? 10 minutes or less of video content per class, an opportunity to research images and respond to their peers po the peer posts. Um, and finally, introductions were based on prior lessons and verbal feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And uh, a huge round of applause in the chat, I hope, and out loud uh, for this incredible panel. I'd love to invite all of our panelists to uh, to join us and turning on their cameras um, as we celebrate you and your students. Um, and I'd also love to bring back our guest moderator whose work inspired all of this learning, uh, Stephen Johnson. And um, our panel has agreed to stay on another 10 minutes or so. Um, and we will we'll, we'll keep it to that so that we can be mindful of everyone's time, but definitely want some uh, reflection time before we close. Um, so maybe I'll start by turning it over to you, Stephen for opening reflections of, from what you've seen and also to kick off our Q&A. Well, first off, let me just say how it's just so moving uh, to see this work um, be brought in our classroom in so many creative ways. Uh, it's just, uh, it's it's very powerful to see uh, as an author and a whatever TV person I am. Um, so thank you really from the bottom of my heart for doing all this and, and I learned so much from, from these things. I'm gonna just, I took a bunch of notes. So I'm just gonna very quickly, I wanna to turn to a couple of questions, including some from our uh, people who are tuned in, but just uh, just kind of one by one, Aqueta, uh, the, the, the public service announcements um, is such a powerful idea, it seems to me, because you know that's exactly what is missing with so many of these innovations. I mean, you know, one big theme is the eradication of smallpox, which is such an incredible achievement. And, and yet, you know, nobody ran an ad campaign talking about how great that was. And so right. get, getting the students to think that way and to present their own PSAs, I think that's a, uh, that's a wonderful approach. I really, really love seeing that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just gonna quickly, then, I, then I'll turn it over to ask some questions. Um, uh, uh, oh, Sh Shalia, um, so I, I won't have time to write the history of language <laughs> as your student asked, 
for in time for next year. But I did want to say, and I allude to this in other things, that now, one, we're hopeful to make more, we're hopeful that we will make more episodes next year. And the, the one thing that is definitely happening is that there's a middle grade version of the book coming out next year for kind of, I don't know, fifth through eighth graders, I would say. And it's organized more around these, these unsung heroes. So you really have in each chapter, it's a little bit easier to read, I think, for, for a younger reader. And you really have it focused on the people a bit more, which hopefully makes it more accessible. So that, while I can't do the history of language in time for that, maybe that'll be helpful. Um, oh, and Michelle, I just, I love this phrase of, um, in thinking about the way we teach global health, this idea of, of hope in a topic that often seems hopeless, right? That is such like what we're trying to do is to, is to remind people that there is reason for hope. And while there is still, there's massive health inequalities inside our cities here in the United States and globally, it is possible to reduce that gap by, by learning from these lessons uh, uh, from, from history. So that, I thought that was a wonderful phrase. Uh, Cleopatra, uh, one thing we are working on in this plan for season two is food deserts. We want to do something about nutrition and food. It's, it's such an important issue. Um, I was literally just emailing earlier today. So I think that's great that you brought that in. And I, I don't know if it's in the Pulitzer package, the way that they did the clips, but there, if there isn't, there's a really powerful sequence about W.E.B. Du Bois in Philadelphia in, in the... Um, in the seventh ward. And what you were talking about in terms of community assets, it, it is in there, Fareed? Yeah, okay, good. I'll put so, the link in the chat. Yeah, so so what you were talking about, about community assets and inventorying a community's assets, that's exactly what Du Bois did in Philadelphia and trying to understand what was happening in, in and as you said, the, the kind of the lived experience of people in this community, how that was impacting their health and, you know, and he did it, when he was 28 years old or whatever, it was just an amazing, you know, his, his own story is so interesting and powerful, I think. Um, and then Tanita, um, first off, Nearpod seems incredibly cool. So thank you for sharing that technology. But um, I love the, the, the hand washing, the way they were responding to that, that really struck a chord to me because it, you know, so much of what, what we're trying to do is, you know, these, a lot of this is history. It's kind of science history and social history, but we really want it to feel connected to people's lives today. And so that you can talk about, okay, everybody's been thinking about hand washing this year. Um, where did that come from? Somebody had to figure out that soap was really a powerful source, you know, and so that you actually get, history doesn't seem like this thing that's just dead and you're memorizing a bunch of facts, but it's actually vitally connected to the lives you live right now. And, and, and I'm really happy that, that hand washing was able to build that kind of bridge for some of the students as it seemed like. So, so the, those are just you know, rapid fire thoughts that I had because I just wanted to respond quickly. But I, my question, one question for me, and then there are one or two questions that have come in from the audience, which is my first one is just how generally surprised were the kids by this macro story of life expectancy? Did, 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 did it, take them by surprise or was it something that they vaguely knew? Curious what, what your sense was. My students were shocked, mm. shocked. And I have really like super smart students and they were all like, holy cow, how did I not know this? I am 18, I've never heard this before. Interesting. Yeah, I'd say too, my, sorry, I quit, go. Sorry. I think in my experience, it was similar to how you sort of talked about it in the videos. It was a taken for granted kind of mm -hmm. element. Like, you know, yes, we know people who live long periods of time, but never necessarily realizing that this was a major sort of change. So I don't necessarily think that mine were, I think it's just sort of like, it's a taken for granted fact of life. Mm -hmm. is what my students. Shaya, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was going to say they, they were also just very surprised. And I, I think all of the information was very new to them. And uh, as I said, so many of them wanted to study it further and, and know more about it. For that reason, I had one student say, um, 
I like it and it would be good to learn more about this topic because it's really important to know and to get this specific knowledge would be very helpful later on in life. So, so many times students say, never gonna, when am I gonna use this again? And to have them <laughs> unprompted say, this is what I need to know. This is what I'm gonna use later on was pretty um, powerful, I thought. And uh, it showed just how much they need to study it more. Um, some students were, uh, one, one student said they didn't have resources to fight Ebola in Africa when really the segment was saying that they did in fact just need to honor their own grassroots mm -hmm. resources and the power that was there. So that made me say, okay, we need to do it more so, so that they get that. That's great. There's a question that came in that related to something that I wanted to ask about as well, which is from Francis Loke, which is about the, the, um, the challenges of synthesizing what is really a multidisciplinary story. Um, and, and Charlie, you kind of raised this a little bit in connecting it to STEAM and things like that. I mean, you know, part of what I was trying to argue in the, in the whole project is that we get better solutions when we do cross disciplines, right? And when we have people who are experts in medical science who are also connected to people who are good at public speaking or advocacy or legal reforms, and it's by combining those things. And it is interesting with this project, like where it sits in the curriculum, right? Which, is it a history? Is it a, is it a science, you know? Um, and I, I'm curious, just seconding that question, um, you know, do, what are the challenges? What are the opportunities in, in teaching a kind of cross-disciplinary story like this? Uh, well, I had mentioned doing the interdisciplinary work, and really my short answer to that is whatever challenge there may be, the way you overcome it is just networking, bring in guest speakers, connect with people, talk to the Pulitzer Center, you know, that, that's, that's how you get around it. If somebody says no, talk to somebody else. Hmm. Stephen, I would add identifying a common thread with a central thematic focus. Mm. So my focus, um, because we are a STEM school, is problem solving, mm. and more specifically, community problem solving. So I like to make it real world relevant for students, and I think it makes it a lot easier to have those critical conversations and engage um, in an interdisciplinary manner with other departments, and, and as well as my colleagues who are teaching different subjects. You know, that that's that's... Uh, the problem solving side of it is so important. You're exactly right. And, and I think actually one of the things that is powerful to me that we really worked hard on in the show, and hopefully this comes across in some of those little segments is that they're, I think that they're, they can be good for kids because they're all in a sense, kind of little mysteries on some level. There's, a, there's some rogue data. If people are dying for some reason, no one can, but like people with Semmelweis or Florence Nightingale, they can't figure out why they're dying or what's going on. And, and somebody cracks the code or they, you know, they figured out what, you, you know, looking at the clues, they figure out how to solve this problem. And, and so, you know, I think people just tend to, you know, lean forward in their seats when there's a mystery and, a, and, and, and there's a, on some level a detective on the case. So, you know, it's kind of using those storytelling forms then to get people inspired to say, hey, we have solved these problems. And now we've got a whole new set of problems that we got to solve. And, and you're living through one of them in this pandemic, of course. Um, but I hope that that, I think that that's a, that narrative form is, is a powerful thing in the classroom. Can I, um, I wanna add and chime in um, overall. I think that this was so timely and so important, especially for younger students, um, because you know it's a journalism class. So discussion is primary in the class. We talk every day, which is so important right now that the kids are separated, everyone's at home. And this was an opportunity to talk about and discuss something that's impacting all of us in real time. Um, so when we, I think one of the best parts about this series was the point, was the fact that students had an opportunity to witness prior health crises and to see that people got through it. And that led to a certain sense of optimism for the current health crisis. And we had that discussion and the kids felt better. We talked about it. 
it was it was that you know that sense that you know we've overcome something just like this in the past and not just once not just twice and not just on one continent but around the world mm -hmm. and so it's very important as as an educator as a teacher to be able to leave students with a sense of optimism um you know to, to keep a smile on your face even if you know if you're a little nervous yourself and to be able to have concrete evidence visually um, of that made me feel good. And you could see that continued level of optimism. They're gonna take that beyond the class session because every time they remember the lessons, the hand washing, the smallpox vaccine, every time they remember that we, we, you know, we were able to say, we don't even hear about smallpox anymore. But it was something we saw hieroglyphics with smallpox in the video, which had been around for so long. Then we saw real photographs of smallpox. So we know it was real, but we don't even hear about it now. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, demonstrate demonstrative that we can overcome um, even what we're in right now. And I think that was very valuable. That's great to hear. Well, I, I just want one last question. Actually, I wanted to just run back to uh, I mentioned the PSA is a quite at its beginning, but um, I'm also interested in, so you were teaching it in the context of a human geography class and which yeah. had a demography kind of theme. There's a demography, through. there's a demography unit that we cover. And how, because that, I mean, at some level, that's the most logical it's, place to put exactly. this. You know, I mean, it's exactly. It's a perfect, touch. but how, in, what percentage of the students take that class? So my school is unique in that students don't graduate from our school. They come there to take specialized courses, right? So throughout the district, though, I think that there are probably at least 20 of those classes taught throughout yeah. the district. So I, it's not, it's an elective social. Yeah, mm. it's just, I mean, I don't know. I just think about all the things that I learned in school and it feels like that, that these basic questions of, what happened to us as human beings <laughs> and, yeah. in our lives and, and our families and our chances of our children living like that is, I mean, it, it's one of the core essential questions of the, the quality of life that you have and the quality of the society you have. So, you know, yeah. I, I hope we can, you know, extra life aside, we should be teaching this generally. Um, right. And human geography is an interdisciplinary course, which is right. perfect because like you you know the geography and you're at, guided by where and why. So where and why do you see demographic um, trends? Where and why do you where and why do you see cultural trends? So it's all sort of it all blends together. So this was a perfect, you know, it was a perfect mix for that class. Well, thank you all so much for, for doing this and, and for chatting. I could chat about this all day, but um, maybe we'll come back and do another one of these uh, next year. I would, I would be honored to if that's a possibility. Thank you so much, Stephen, and thank you, panelists. I'm just going to drop one more time into the chat our survey for today, where we would love to collect some of your feedback and also ideas and, and inspirations from today's uh, webinar. Uh, everyone here will, and, and also anyone who registered will receive a recording and we're checking with the teachers who are on the panel today to see what we can share from our slides so that hopefully if you wanted to dive deeper or show your students some of the amazing student work that you can. Um, but if you if you uh, would like any other support connecting this story or any Pulitzer Center supported uh, reporting project to your classroom, you can reach out to us at education at PulitzerCenter.org. Um, and before we uh, close, I would love to just hold a moment to thank you all. And also if anyone uh, wanted to share a closing reflection or piece of advice for our uh, guests today, um, to open it up to that uh, and then and then we'll wrap up. And I can just go right round. If you just wanna say like, no, that's okay. <laughs> um, but we'll start with uh, maybe Aqueta, anything else you wanted to share? No, I'm just very happy to have been able to hear all of you guys' integration. I really love the projects that you all did. So thank you. And I'm going to use them next year. <laughs> you know, I want to see if I can get your Nearpod link. Uh, I know you can share Nearpod, so I would love that. Um, it's in the, I put it in the chat. I put the website in the chat oh, too. So I need to go back up and get it. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Chat is saved too. We'll share it with everyone. Tanita, what about you? Great lesson overall. I love the visuals. They were great for students. Um, 
across all curriculum. So yeah, great opportunity. Thank you very much for allowing us to be a part of it. Thank you, um, Shalia. I'm just kind of going around my screen here. Over to you. Yeah, I really appreciate all the questions and people who took an interest in this and hope to share it further from here. Thank you. And Michelle? It was nice meeting all of you virtually. I really enjoyed hearing how all of you used um, the PBS videos and the article. So thank you, Stephen Johnson. Thanks for writing this. I just started the book, which I'm really excited <laughs> about. So thank you. And Fareed, thank you, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Warren. It's always an honor to work with the Pulitzer Center. I'm always excited to be a part of all of your programs. They are truly enriching and have enriched my instructional practice as a 23 year veteran educator. Thank you to all participants and panelists. Thank you for your feedback and your collaboration today. Have a great summer. Indeed, um, and I'm putting in the chat if you'd like to explore some more curriculum from Dr. Warren, from Shalia, who were part of our teacher fellowship, it is in the chat. Um, and Stephen, anything we should know about next steps for the project or um, your takeaways from today? Well, one just takeaway is here we have this beautifully prepared curriculum uh, uh, and all the work that we did, but just the diversity of approaches to teaching it that we saw on this panel was so great to see. There's so many, it shows you there's so many different ways to explore it. Um, so that was just thrilling. And yeah, we're, we're, um, we're uh, the, the, the uh, kids book is definitely, will be coming out um, about a year from now. And uh, the, uh, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about a season two, but if you know anything about television, <laughs> <laughs> you could only <laughs> be consciously optimistic until the day it airs. That's the way it works. But uh, but I hope that we'll we'll be back with more episodes. Well, thank you all. Taking a, a tip from from Dr. Warren, wishing you wonderful summers and a wonderful rest of your week, and look forward to continuing to collaborate with all of you and for uh, to can you continue learning together. Thank you so much. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you, panelists. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Okay. Bye.